Well, my friends, and welcome to Perfect Practice. Today, I am very excited because I'm having a conversation with somebody who I can totally relate to. He's a serial entrepreneur, somebody who's extremely passionate about making the world a better place, and somebody who follows his dreams no matter where they take him. He's bold. He is someone who speaks his truth, somebody who inspires me and literally thousands of other people. He's been of service to my community for many, many years, and I am speaking about none other than Jared Yellen. Jared, thanks for joining me today. Ah, thank you, my friend. Honored to be here. Uh, everything you said about me, I'll just throw back at you as well. Plus, I'll add, um, I love the way that you operate the level at which you stay in the space of integrity and just do what's right, regardless of who's watching is extremely inspiring. So keep doing it. And I'm honored to be here. Ask me anything. I want to create a lot of value for your audience and your community. Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, I receive that, uh, you know, with an open heart. So thank you for the acknowledgement. Uh, it, it's, it's great to hear it. And I need a little Jared following me around because sometimes... <laughs> <laughs> sometimes uh, we forget ourselves. So thank you for, for honoring me and remembering that. And I appreciate that. So I know that, you know, since we've last spoke, um, since we've last seen each other in person, we've spoken on and off for the last uh, year and a half, two years with everything going on in the world, right? We got to find our people and stay connected to them. But I haven't seen you in a couple of years, but I've been following, you know, all the amazing things that you've been doing. So if you could kind of recap for us what you've been up to these last couple of years and uh, maybe some highlights from your journey. And I'd, and I'd love to like jump into some of the things that you're up to today. Because for those of you listening, you're going to want to stick around till the very end because we've got a very unique and special opportunity for you to get involved in something really big that Jared's been working on for the last couple of years. And, and, uh, and so uh, let's jump right in. What, uh, what cool. have you been up yeah. to these past few years? I love it. So I'll take you back even a little bit further, just in case there's people that, that have no idea who I am and how I, I landed on this, this wonderful interview with you. So I realized at a very early age that I was perpetually and utterly unemployable. So I just didn't even try. And I just decided to go all in an entrepreneurship. And I've had a pretty solid run now for the past 17 years with some beautiful learning experiences that were sprinkled throughout. I'm what you call, as you know, a non-technical tech founder. So there is not an engineering bone in my entire body. I know how to write direct response marketing copy, and I know how to sell. And somehow, some way, I did everything you could conceivably do wrong while building a B2B SaaS platform. SaaS is software as a service, and B2B is business to business. But I somehow landed on my feet, and it's actually a pretty successful company today. But I mean, I literally did everything you could do wrong. I don't even know if you know to the degree of how I did everything you could do wrong. So years mm -hmm. ago, I started by outsourcing software development to a firm in Boston, Massachusetts, that had a really good track record. And and they told me that it would take about 10 months and $750,000 to build the first version of this vision that I had. And I just went all in. I had the resources to do it. I self-funded it. And I mean, I was all in. It ended up taking over two years and over $2 million, mm. which I also self-funded because I actually had those resources. It would have been better off if I didn't because I wouldn't have burned through the cash, but I had it. So I self-funded it. And then it was time to launch. And I learned this term that I never heard before. And it's a really gnarly term called technical debt. And what technical debt means is that engineers cut corners, you accumulate debt from bad decisions. And it's almost inevitable that if you have enough debt, the entire thing will implode. And that was my story. The whole thing imploded after over two years and over $2 million invested. And I was crazy enough to still think I was onto something. I'm like, there's a need for this solution in the market. But what I've learned from this experience is you can't outsource software development. Like you just can't mm. do it at this early stage. So I said, I'm going to start building my own team. And I ended up hiring a CTO that had experience building both, both international and domestic teams. He lived in the same town I was in, which was kind of a coincidence. And uh, I hired him. I said, I want all of your attention. I don't want fractional. I want you. I'll pay you whatever you need. Let's do this. And we did. And we started building our own software development team in the US, in Canada, and then in India as well. He was originally from India, but I met him when he was living in North New Jersey and everything was great. The only challenge was it was really hard for us to retain our team in India because everybody was contractors and it's hard for contractor income to get recognized by banks. So they just couldn't get personal loans. And I wanted to mm. improve their quality of life. So I set up a company in India at the end of 2017 that I own just to hire our team. We then use that almost like a magnet for talent. We were able to attract really good talent as a result. And then that became my catalyst for that company, which is called Sinduit. And Sinduit's a marketing software for small business owners. We've now scaled that company to tens of thousands of paying users 
across 30 different industries. So it's a cool story because I literally did everything you could do wrong. I'm non-technical. I didn't raise any capital. I somehow found a way to rub tubs, two sticks together to actually validate this idea and then scale it into what it is today. But you said what I've been doing for the past two years. And this magical thing happened just around two years ago where I woke up one day and I realized I'm officially obsolete at Synduit. And as you know, that's every entrepreneur's dream, or at the very least, it, it should be their dream. So I was really proud of the milestone. I was just thinking to myself, what do I do next? At the time, mm -hmm. I'm 35 years old, two young kids, very happily married, with a wonderful lifestyle. And I realized for me that this next chapter had to be my moonshot. I had to do something that would just shake up the world or I was going to go down trying. And as I started digging deeper into that, I had one of those moments, one of those like calling moments. And it was really loud for me. And the calling was do what you just did at Sindu it, but do it 10,000 more times over the next 10 years. And I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, that's freaking mm. crazy. But one thing I know, and you know this as well, because you have callings too, right? Is you never negotiate against the calling. You just go with it. So I didn't ask questions. And I just went with it. And I called up my CTO from Synduit. And then this woman named Katie, who's my director of operations, kind of like my right-hand woman in business. And I said, I have this crazy idea. It's a calling for me. I'm not saying it's a calling for you, but I'm going to invite you to make it your calling. Let's build, scale, and sell 10,000 tech companies over the next 10 years. Are you in? And their exact words, Sachin, were, we're in because it's you. We have no idea what you're talking about. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> let me explain we're going to launch a tech ecosystem. Some people might think this is an incubator and others might call this a tech accelerator. And those are wonderful programs. That's just not what this is. What this is, is a place where entrepreneurs from around the world can come and pitch their tech ideas that are on a napkin, like, like just like this, like a napkin, like the concept phase. Because everything that exists today it had to start there, right? You can't bypass the step called idea. That's where everything begins. Tesla was once an idea. The mm -hmm. Virgin brand was once an idea. You can't bypass that step. And all I want to hear are the ideas. So what we do is we have entrepreneurs from around the world come and pitch us in this really safe environment. And what we're looking for is the right person with the right idea in the right market and the right business model. And when those four things are present, we end up co-founding a company with that entrepreneur we both take equity in the company, so our values are aligned, we want the same outcome, and then we build the entire company at cost. Everything from the software development to the product management, the go-to-market, the business development, the branding, the press, the sales, the customer support, the legal, the bookkeeping, the investor relations, like everything. And about 97% of the initial costs for what we call the minimum viable company, because we don't launch products, we launch companies, is at cost in India in a company that I've owned since the end of 2017. So mm. the risk is low and the cost is low. So a little less than two years ago, we launched Project 10K, which is committed to building, scaling, and selling 10,000 tech companies over the next 10 years while ensuring, and this is the key, that every entrepreneur that we say yes to has the support and infrastructure to achieve product market fit. And we define that as $10,000 of monthly recurring revenue, which is not a big number, but it's everything in tech because almost nothing gets there. When you achieve that milestone, you can raise capital, you can get strategic alliances, there's, there's a whole myriad of opportunities that transpire. So in our first two weeks, we co-founded seven companies, which was really helpful because it gave us a chance to actually figure out what I was talking about, because this was really just a moonshot. And it gave us a chance to figure out processes and systems and the math around hiring. We scaled from a dozen people to a little over 100 people really quickly on the team. And about 15 months ago, we stepped on the gas and we have not looked back since. We've had thousands of entrepreneurs from literally around the world come through this process, everywhere from Africa to the Dominican Republic to small little cities in the US to Canada. I mean, it's really inspiring like how decentralized it truly is. We ended up co-founding right around 150 companies in our first year, which is way more remarkable than 10,000 in 10 years, because this was really the year to figure out how to do this, which we have. But what I'm more proud of, and I want your audience to hear, is we are not playing law of averages. Because law of averages would state, launch 10,000 companies, have seven winners, the winners win, we win because we're a holding company, and everybody else suffers the same way they would suffer if they did it by themselves. I know you and I know me, we stand against suffering, right? So I don't want them to suffer. So what we do is a lot of testing on the front end. So by the time we actually say yes, 
I can't guarantee it, but there's a high probability of the outcome, which is build, scale, and sell. And we're not looking to sell unicorns. We're looking to sell viable businesses within 18 to 24 months. So now that we're doing this, my certainty around our ability to execute is an 11 out of 10. It really is extreme. And it's a function of three things. One, we have a very strong leadership team and beyond. Um, two, we have a profound ecosystem of co-founders, investors, and just overall strategic people and organizations. And then three, and maybe the most important, we have a ton of attention and from the right people slash organizations, athletes and celebrities, politicians, foundations, family offices, tech incubators and accelerators that have partnered with us, like people of influence. And the reason why we have so much attention is really because the impact. We're democratizing and decentralizing the tech industry without even trying. Our portfolio is this diverse. We have more women than men right now as founders, which is just really cool. I don't, we didn't even try, it just happens, so that's great. We have most ethnicities that are represented. Our youngest founder is 11 and the oldest is 77 because it's never too early and never too late when you have the right team. And we have high school dropouts and Ivy League graduates. Like it's just so diverse. So it's really exciting. And uh, we're truly actualizing dreams. And people have these dream tech ideas, but they don't know where to go with them. They now have a home to work with us. That's amazing. And I know there's uh, multiple ways that people can be involved in this, right? And so if let's say somebody's listening to this and they say, I want to be involved. I don't have an idea, but I love what's going on here. Uh, I love for them to know what they can do. And I love for people who do have an idea, uh, maybe, maybe a, a software or a company that like to launch. Uh, what are the two paths that people can take to become involved in this process? Yeah. So one of the things that I really stand for is democratizing anything that exists, like leveling the playing field, right? I know you stand for this as well. So we, we have to level the playing field. And we've done that now from the standpoint of enabling people that are at the idea stage that traditionally are ignored, like there's nowhere for them to go to actually have a home. And that home is by going through our process it's pitching us their idea. The ones that we see have the most viability. We then invite them into the actual experience called due diligence. We go significantly deeper with them. And then if we still see potential, we'll then end up co-founding a company with them. One of the things that I wanna do, and I know that you're excited about this too, is I want you to be one of our ambassadors because you have a beautiful audience of impact-driven entrepreneurs. And I have to imagine there's at least dozens, maybe hundreds, and maybe even thousands of ideas that most likely are gonna to go to the graveyard with people because they're not gonna know how to execute. They're not gonna know where to go or they're gonna do maybe something even worse, which is bring on the wrong person or hire mm. the wrong company, spend six or maybe even seven figures and years of their life and then have it fall short. So as one of our ambassadors, what we do is we invite people of influence that have entrepreneurs in their ecosystem that might have ideas to come through you so that if we end up saying yes, you're on the cap table as well as a co-founder. And that's really cool because you're heart-centered, you're mission-driven, you have a large audience. So I want to invite anyone that has a software idea. That's all that we do is just software. It could be software as a service, whether it's B2B or B2C. It could be a marketplace. It could be a social media platform. If you have a software idea, go to project10k.com forward slash Sachin, S-A-C-H-I-N, and just schedule your complimentary pitch our team usually charges a fee to pitch, but we're making it complimentary, so it's free for you. It's a five-minute pitch with our team, and we prepare you for it. We give you a training, a video training that we put together. We give you a manual and then also the actual presentation itself, so you can just plug in your idea. There's no idea that's too early. So if you're like, yeah, I've been thinking about this app that does blank, just pitch it to us. Just do it. Don't worry mm -hmm. about doing market research yet. Just pitch it to us. Let us tell you whether or not we believe that it's viable, and if it is, we're going to move you into the next step, which is due diligence, and you'll start doing some more research for that. So it's project10k.com forward slash Sachin, S-A-C-H-I-N. Just schedule the pitch. Don't overthink it. Don't ask your significant other. Don't ask your mentor. Just, just do it. Like Get that idea out of your heart and get it into our ecosystem so that we can see whether or not there's potential there. In addition, we stand to democratize investing. So one of the things that I personally stand against is this whole premise of you have to be accredited to invest in private placement opportunities. I just stand against it because I know people that are not accredited that have more money in the bank than people who are accredited because they actually live within their means. 
And now the SEC is stating that you can or can't invest in things. So I've been on a mission to try to find some way to let both invest. I can obviously have accredited people invest, but I want non-accredited investors to have a chance to invest as little as $1,000 if they wanted to. And every security lawyer that I spoke with said we couldn't do it. Like every one of them now, since the beginning, like, no, you can't do it. You fall under the Investment Company Act. And I'm like, but why? We're not an investment company. We're an operating company that just happens to have portfolio companies. That's just the business that we're in. But we're not an investment company. And then I finally, one day I got an email from uh, the chief revenue officer from WeFunder, which is the number one equity crowdfunding platform in the world. And they reached out and they said, we love what you're doing. We have to find a way to partner. So we had a call and I said, the perfect way for us to partner is you get us approved for a rank CF. Let us be the, the poster example of your platform because there's never been a company like ours that has been able to use that vehicle to let accredited and non-accredited investors invest. So after months and months of their lawyers talking with our lawyers, they actually found a way for us to do it. It's fully above board and it's a huge opportunity because now you can become a shareholder of the whole portfolio for as little as a thousand dollars or as much as you want. You can invest tens of thousands of dollars as well. It's wefunder.com forward slash project 10K. No matter what, I recommend that you go there because it explains what we do. So if you're interested in tech or innovation or ideation, that just like juices you, just go to wefunder.com forward slash project 10K, watch the video and then read about what we actually do. And I encourage you to get involved because then you can truly co-author what I say is the story of entrepreneurship as we democratize tech together. I love that. I mean, I love that you're thinking about how to get as many people involved as possible and bringing people's ideas to life or at least providing a platform for them to express their ideas and then using your team and your experience to, to validate them or, you know, tweak them a little bit so that they do, they do become viable uh, opportunities for people. I, I also love the accredited versus non-accredited uh, in investment opportunity because, you know, it's funny how uh, the system kind of works against some people, <laughs> right? And it's like, it's like when people have poor credit, they, are charged more interest. And it's yeah. like, it's like a sinking ship that these people just can't get out of. And when people are not accredited investors in most scenarios, they can't jump in on these life-changing wealth building opportunities. Uh, and they have to get much involved much later in the retail markets versus getting involved in the earlier rounds of investment. So it's cool that, you know, they have this opportunity to diversify uh, their portfolio, regardless of whether they, you know, fall into the criteria of being accredited or not. And, and I love that this is far more inclusive. You're inclusive of everyone's ideas, at least giving them, you know, shining some light on them and giving them the time of day. And then you're also inclusive in uh, involving as many people as you can to get involved from an investment standpoint. What I love to know, Jared, is what are some ideas? Like, um, I know that, you know, the people in our community are often uh, involved with health, um, but, you know, these ideas are across the board, right? It doesn't have to be a specific industry. So maybe you can, you can help us if it's, if it's okay for you to share uh, some, some ideas that have come up or some samples of ideas, just so we can get people's brains thinking of, of like, you know, their, their ideas and if, if they're viable to, you know, to pitch to your team. I love to. So I'm going to share the story of, of Crystal Morrison, who I actually introduced you to. And the platform launches next week. So it's really exciting um, from the time of this recording. So Crystal Morrison, just a little bit of background here because it'll create context. Um, she's also a non-technical tech founder now. She's a scientist by background with her PhD. She's a very, very smart woman. And she was a career woman building this very, very successful career. And then she she was pregnant, was becoming a mother, and that, that became her, her focus. And then when her child was born, he was born on the spectrum. And that became her, her undivided focus. Like that was her life. And she actually decided to put her career on pause because she wanted to be a mom to her son. She's like, he needs me. I want to be there for him. I'm going all in. And she did that happily. This wasn't like a compromise. Like she wanted to be a mom to her son. But the challenge that she realized as a mom to a son who's on the spectrum is that she actually wasn't really a mom. She was a liaison of information. And she had to liaison information from the OT to the PT to the speech to the behaviorist to the grandparent. And it was exhausting. Like she just wanted to be a mom. She didn't want to pass information from all these parties. So she made a commitment and she said, you know what? My, my greatest inefficiency in life, my greatest challenge in life is going to turn into a wonderful opportunity for our family so that other people don't have the same challenge that I've had to experience. And what I've realized is it takes a village 
to raise a child. And it takes a really big village to raise a child with special needs. And that led to the idea for Meerkat Village. And Meerkat Village actually launches like one week from the time of this recording. And what Meerkat Village is, is a platform for, we're starting with special needs with a lot of use case for this, where a family who has a child with special needs is able to set up a village to support the child. So OT, speech, behaviorist, grandparent can all literally collaborate inside of this app to support that child, share resources, documentation, food trackers, anything. So there's one central location to support that child. It's really disruptive technology because what it's doing is building a category called village driven care. There's a lot of use case for this even outside of just the special needs community, obviously with the other extreme, the mature adult as well. There's a need for village driven support. So that's an idea, an idea that was literally on a napkin that Crystal just committed to, and she's a mom on a mission. So you never want to stop a mom on a mission, but it's a really great solution. It's an eloquent solution to a complex challenge. Another great example is uh, Dr. Stephanie out of Akron, Ohio. So Dr. Stephanie is a dentist and she was watching um, this training that I led probably about 18 months ago. And the training was about how to identify the idea that you're meant to solve. And I asked this question, I said, what is stealing your time, your money, or both, either personally or professionally? And that was like the resounding theme of this training. So she's like, that's an interesting question. I don't know. So she went into her office the next day in Akron, Ohio, and she said to her small little team, she said, what's stealing our time and money in the office? And within 60 seconds, the team said, it's missed appointments that don't get rescheduled. She's hmm. like, that's interesting. How, what's the damage? What's the economic damage of that? And they said, well, last year we did about $900,000 in revenue and we lost $77,000 on missed appointments that don't get rescheduled. And she's like, let me see if my colleagues have this issue. So she started asking her colleagues, do you have this issue? And every single person she spoke with said that anywhere from seven to up to 12% of top line revenue is lost in the practice for that reason alone. So let's pretend you have a dental appointment on Thursday of next week and you cancel it on a Monday, what do you think happens behind the scenes? There's someone making a phone call trying to get people from the wait list to actually take that appointment. It's really inefficient and no one answers their phone anymore. So like mm -hmm. they don't end up filling the seat. That seat in a dental office is anywhere from 300 to $3,000, depending on the procedure that was being conducted. So what we built is an automated platform that goes to the wait list and starts sending out text messages to the wait list, driving them to this spot and in the first month of Dr. Stephanie using this, just kind of testing it out, she recouped $7,000 of revenue that she would have lost otherwise. Like it just, it would never have, she would never have been able to reschedule it through this very eloquent solution to this complex challenge. So what we look to focus on, this is really important for your audience, is we don't want to build exponential change. Peter Diamandes dominates that market. The stuff that Peter does is just exponential change, right? But it's mm -hmm. also really risky for investors. And the people that invest in, in Peter's projects, they do it knowing that most likely they're never going to see ROI because it's just going to take too long. And, that, and he knows that too. These are really audacious things he's trying to do. And I love it. I think it's amazing that he's dominating that space, but it could take 20 years to see ROI on some of those initiatives. So there's a lot of risk associated with it. And the reason they're investing is more because of the impact, not necessarily because it's a really good, like, like fiscal responsibility to make that investment. What we focus on is incremental difference practical solutions to everyday challenges in people's personal or professional lives. There are tens of thousands of these across every industry and in specific countries as well. So we're building tech for the construction industry, real estate industry, different specific niches within healthcare. We're building B2C tech too. And we have this really cool platform called Wellness Window that your audience would love. There's a free trial if they want to check it out. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a health and wellness app. Really cool. Like we integrated into different delivery services and there's there's menus built inside of it and it has different health programs and you can pick the menu that's the most appropriate for you based on your goals and it automatically sends you the stuff in the supermarket that that is directly on that that menu so it's a really cool platform so our portfolio is very diverse what's consistent is we really look for ideas that have a financial model attached to it the whole thesis of Instagram sold and never made a one dollar of revenue right it sold for a billion dollars to Facebook every one Instagram there's like tens of thousands of things that never see the light of day because mm -hmm. they have no revenue model. Whereas if you actually have a revenue model, it's probably like one in every few hundred make it. Because even when you first launch, if you get 10 users to pay you a hundred bucks a month each, you're in business, right? Like, mm -hmm. but if it's a free solution, like 
you have to sell to somebody. So now you're selling to investors and that's, that's a hard sale. So we really look for solutions that have a business model so that we can just validate it quickly in the market and then start building off of the validation that we've been able to establish. That's awesome. That's awesome. And you bring your experience, your team's experience, and uh, you've got some amazing uh, influencers, people who've been very influential in the health space uh, and in the software space that are also helping you. So uh, I'd love to know, like, what, what are you most excited about? Aside from the things that you share, like, what, what is the grand vision that you see? You, you know, we're trying to be as inclusive as possible. We're trying to include, you know, investors with various backgrounds and trying to include as many ideas as we can. Where do you see this headed, um, you know, 10 years from now? What, uh, what's the vision there? It's a new standard in entrepreneurship. And, and I've thought a lot about this. So one of the things that's really important to realize is that this project is bigger than me. So the reason I was called to do it is because I really don't have an ego. Like I don't need or want attention. I just want my kids and my wife to think I'm wonderful and, and I'm good. Like I don't <laughs> need the world to think that. So uh, the person that had to catalyze this had to operate that way. Because if it was really about me, then I would suppress its ability to become what it's meant to be in this world. But one of the things that I've realized is every single industry has been disrupted to date. If you think about it, right? The transportation industry, the hospitality industry, the food industry, the blockchain is disrupting banking. Like every industry becomes disrupted and rightfully so because industries get to a point where they're inefficient and then innovation comes in and there's a disruption and it creates a whole new level of efficiency. But there's this one industry that has actually withstood the test of time and it's mediocre at best and broken at worst. And the industry has a one to 2% success rate which means it hurts more people than it helps, but somehow it's been the same way for thousands of years. And that industry is called entrepreneurship. It's mm. really a very devastating industry if you think about it, like one to 2% success rate, like that's, that's, that's alarming. Like why is there no innovation to the industry of entrepreneurship? But I get why the success rate's so low. Because when that person commits to being an entrepreneur and pursuing their dream, they get on a boat and the boat takes them to this island it drops them off on the island and it says, figure it out and then leaves them. And what they have to figure out is everything from bookkeeping mm. to contracts to hiring. If it's tech, they have to figure out the tech. They have to figure out how to write copy. They have to figure out graphic design. They have to figure out how to hire contractors. Like, so if they make one or two mistakes, it's over. Like, like mm. they're on an island by themselves. They don't have a <laughs> lot of chances to figure it out. So what we're doing is we're disrupting the model of entrepreneurship. We're starting with tech because that's the space that I know, and it's also reduced risk, and I'll explain more about that in a bit. But the actual model of entrepreneurship that we're causing is called an ecosystem. And if you think about nature, that's the greatest ecosystem that exists, how does it just work so perfectly, right? Like everything has a role in nature. It's so harmonious. Like the birds have a role, the sun has a role, the grass, like everything is there with a purpose. Everybody shares everything. Well, that's actually what Project 10K is. It's an ecosystem. And every company in this ecosystem is there in service of each other. So as a byproduct, whenever we can, if there's relevant end users across companies, they work together and they share end users, they share investors, they share strategic relationships, they share what works, they share what doesn't work. Hmm. And then as a byproduct, we're gonna disrupt the industry called entrepreneurship and go from a one to 2% success rate to anywhere from a 40 to 60% success rate with what I call a 100% transformation rate. And what that means is that even if we don't end up selling the company, because there's a lot of factors that come into play with that, the individual will transform on the journey. Because as much as I do care about producing that outcome, build, scale, sell, I care way more about who the individual becomes in the process. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, when they sell, if their spouse hates them, their kids don't know them, and they have autoimmune disease because they just grinded too hard, we failed them. So as much as we talk business, we talk what we call have it all. We hold people accountable to date nights. We hold people accountable to putting their phone down when they get home and they're just with their kids. We hold them accountable to going to the gym and exercising well, because that's actually what matters. Now, why is this fascinating? We attract a different type of entrepreneur. When you think about mm. tech, you're probably thinking about the person that just graduated from Stanford. They're 21 years old. They're going to live in a house with 14 of their friends. They're going to work 24-7, 365. That's not who we've attracted to this point. We're attracting mature professionals who are in industry and they found an inefficiency in their industry that they want to solve. 
So they're mature people and they have kids for the most part. And their kids are either really young or they're teenagers. And that's the coolest part of the whole story because what they're seeing, little eight-year-old Johnny is seeing their mom go after her dream. Like mm. she goes, she's going after her moonshot, right? She's going after it. And in three years, she's going to sell the company for $11 million. And it's going to radically change the economics of that family. But it's even bigger than the economics because now little Johnny is 11 and all that he knows all that he knows is anything is possible because he just saw his mom prove it. That's why we're doing this. It's just a new standard for the youth. It's a new standard in entrepreneurship and it reduces severe pain that entrepreneurship unfortunately is causing on so many people. Man, you know, my son is such a brilliant little guy. He is. And, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I love that you've got really young entrepreneurs involved. You said 11, was that the youngest one? Sebastian, he is, you guys, your son is Sebastian would literally be brothers. Like you would love each other so much. So Sebastian, he's awesome, this guy. So he's a student of personal development. He's listening to personal development. He's reading Thinking Girl Rich. Like he's homeschooled. Like he's, he's just awesome little dude. And uh, his passion outside of learning is Legos. And uh, he has lots of Legos. He's really smart too. So he gets these crazy kits. He puts them together really quickly. And then when he's done, like they kind of all end up in a pile, right? Like this big pile of Legos. And then it's kind of frustrating for him because he wants to rebuild it, but he can't find the pieces. And then his mom ends up like cleaning the playroom and like she like takes the 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 uh, the vacuum and like vacuums one up and he's like oh my god I just lost that piece and and this was Sebastian's like problem the thing stealing his time and money right like that, this was his version of it so he thought of this idea it's really a brilliant idea we're building it as we speak and what the idea is it's an app on your phone that you can actually scan over Legos and it tells you what's there and what you can build and then phase two is we're going to build a marketplace of rare pieces because what I've learned this is like a subculture is that there are like these pieces that actually are a lot of money if you end up losing them so there's a whole business in all of this. But the unfair advantage we bring is we actually know the chairman of Lego and he knows we're, we're doing this with Sebastian. So I don't know what that actually means other than that's pretty darn cool. But it's even cooler that Sebastian's literally pursuing his dream at 11 years old and he has the team to support him. He's created a YouTube channel. It's 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 killing it, like literally killing it. It's amazing. I'll, I'll, I'll share the link if you want to put it in the, in the notes after to see what Sebastian's doing. He's fundraising on WeFunder too. So if you want to support Sebastian's dream, it's wefunder.com forward slash bird I B I R D I. You can support Sebastian. Here's what I've learned though. Everybody needs the right team. That's like obvious though, right? Mm. Like the team is everything, but it's actually everything because the alternative to the right team is a dream that does not get realized because what happens in tech is people either do nothing with their idea because they don't know where to go with it. They don't know what that next step is. So they just make excuses. I'm non-technical. I don't have the resources. I don't know how. And they just like die with their best idea inside. I guarantee there's a better version of Google in the graveyard right now, but someone just didn't execute on it. Or they do gain the courage. They either have capital, they can get capital and they just go too far. They go six or seven figures in, they go one or two years in, they haven't validated anything. And then they launch this big moment, mm -hmm. they launch to crickets. And what do you do if you've dug a big hole, big hole is you just dig a big deeper hole and it's like a death sentence. So what we've done is we've brought discipline to the space of early stage tech. And when we say yes to an entrepreneur, what that means is that within 60 to 90 days, we are launching what we call a minimum viable company that can onboard users and generate cash flow. We then have a fanatical focus to hit $10,000 of monthly recurring revenue within the first 90 days, because that's product market fit. Mm -hmm. The economics are not changing anybody's life, but what that allows us to now do is go out and fundraise, build strategic alliances. It's just a discipline and it's a predictable path for the entrepreneur to follow with our support. Love that, love that. Uh, what is, how has your family responded to all this? Cause I know it probably takes up a lot of time. So I, I love to know how you're finding, and maybe this is a kind of a selfish question for myself as well. I'm always looking for ways to be more present and, and uh, still, you know, live out my dream and live out loud. So I, I love to know if there's any tools you've acquired along the way to, to be able to put the phone down, be more present to the family all while you have all these amazing things going on. So notice I feel an immense responsibility because I what I share with you about as much as I care about build, scale, sell, I care more about who you become in the journey. So I know everybody's watching me now because I, I, I preach that incessantly. <laughs> so that's that's one way is you actually speak into things that you desire and then you're forced to actually be a living example of it. But at five o'clock for me, like this goes away, like I literally throw it away. Like there's nothing that matters. 
and I'm just with my kids till I go to sleep every night. And then they get to sleep around 7.38 and I'm with my wife for an hour, hour and a half till she goes to bed. Then I'll put in 90 minutes to prepare for the next day. And then I'm up early in the gym. Everything is scheduled. So there's not one minute that's not scheduled. And some are like, isn't that rigid? I get everything done as a result. I actually felt the exact opposite. It's like liberating knowing that everything is just laid out for me every day, including my sleep, including when I eat, including when I work out. So I'm just very, very regimented. And I don't have any hacks other than I just live by the schedule. And I now feel responsible to be an example for all the others, because mm -hmm. there are a lot of people in entrepreneurship that preach a very different message than you and I. And that message is grind it out 24, seven, 365, like make compromises. Like you'll take a vacation when you're dead. Like, I just don't believe <laughs> it. Like, I just like, don't, I so stand against it. And I know a lot of those people personally don't live that way. Like they actually live the opposite of that. Like they are spending time with their family. They are taking really cool adventures. They are taking their phone and getting rid of it. So they can just really focus on being present, but they're preaching a message and then they're following thinks that's what entrepreneurship is. That's what autoimmune disease is. Like that's mm. what being lonely at the top is. Like, why can't we just define this as have it all? So for me, I feel incredible responsibility and I use that as an accountability system. And I just schedule everything out of my life. I love that. I love that. Um, I know that you guys had a, a hurricane pass through and, you know, through divine intervention, uh, your space was, uh, very graciously spared. So yes. I, I'm so happy to hear that. And, uh, so grateful that you have electricity and, and, uh, you know, internet and all those things to kind of keep, keep the fire going. And, uh, you know, my prayers to, to Florida for everything that's going on over there. And, and I know that just not too far from you, things were, just basically leveled. So I'm, I'm so grateful and, and thankful that you're okay. And you get to keep doing what you love doing and keep supporting people and uh, keep helping people live their dreams. I mean, it, uh, what better way to, to, to add impact and, and have meaning in this lifetime. I greatly appreciate you, Jared, and our friendship. And I'm so looking forward to, uh, you know, encouraging people to go down this path, pitch their ideas to you. And I'm also excited to uh, you know, to journey on this path with you as well, because I really believe in you and what you're doing. And, and I'm so grateful for our continued friendship and the inspiration that you provide me to be a better version of myself. Awesome. Listen, the sentiment is mutual. You are just a, a living example of someone who, who truly lives what they speak. Um, and, and you don't even speak it, you just live it. And that's really the, the greatest way to lead is just live it like live it out loud, let people see that you are an example of everything that you stand for. So I feel the same way about our friendship. Um, it's exciting to see how far we've come to as a friendship. You really believed in me early on in that Sinduit journey and, and you're an impactful player in what the company became because you helped me enter an industry that became my greatest passion of an industry, which is functional medicine. Like you, you were the entry in, it was Peter Osborne that you heard and then all of a sudden we're here serving hundreds and hundreds of practitioners that are serving thousands of people. It actually was like one of the things that expanded my vision the most about Sinduit back in the day was seeing your, your practitioners going and serving people because of this tool that we built. I'm like, that's amazing. Like that is the coolest thing ever. It's one of the catalysts that leads me to what I'm doing today. Because every time we launch a company, as much as I think about our founder, which I do, I think about all the people that will be impacted as a result, the mm -hmm. economic impact, the jobs it creates, and then like the end users that are now getting time and money back. Because realize that's what every single one of our solutions is derived from, something that's stealing time or money from people, we're just giving it back. So thank you for all that you do. I love our partnership. I know it's just the beginning and the best is yet to come. Amazing. Amazing. Do you want to share those links once again so that yes. uh, we can uh, make sure that everyone has them? Yeah. So if you have an idea and everybody does, right? So you have an idea. I'm just going to assume you have an idea and you're ready to pitch that idea. Head over to project 10 K the number 10 project 10 K.com forward slash Sachin S A C H I N and just schedule your five minute complimentary pitch. It's really fun. Don't be nervous. We give you all the training you need video training, a manual, and then even the presentation. So you can just fill in the exact information that you're going to share with us. And if you want to co-author the story as an investor, you can invest as little as a thousand dollars. We create a really low entry point so that everyone can co-author this up to mm. tens of thousands of dollars. Head over to WeFunder, W-E-F-U-N-D-E-R.com forward slash project 10 K and just get involved. We've all different perks, different tiers you can get involved with. We're really excited about that initiative because we expect probably about 2,000 to 3,000 investors 
will come through that platform, which is cool because that's like part of our community. Like there's part of our inner circle that gets to really see what we're doing. Like, how are we actually doing this? What kind of companies are we saying yes to? So we're really gonna integrate you in. It's wefunder.com forward slash project 10K. Beautiful. Well, thank you, my friend. Here's to your continued growth and success and health and happiness. Send my love to the family. Yes, you as well. And uh, stay safe out there. Lots of love to you. You too, buddy. See you well. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you soon.